If you're a music producer using Ableton Live, you know how powerful this thing can be. But let's face it, it can also be pretty intimidating. With so many hidden features and settings, it's pretty easy to miss out on those tricks that actually make a difference. It took me 10 years to discover some of these, but when I did, my workflow improved massively. I was able to speed up my process and most importantly, make my tracks sound better. That's why today we're gonna go through these five secret settings together. So whether you're just starting out or you've been producing for a while, by the end of this video, you'll be able to use these every every single day and bring your tracks to the next level. Let's start with a huge one. I did this mistake for at least two, three years into producing music. When I was making drums, I would search for like the perfect kick, a strong one with a nice punchy top. And after scrolling for hours to find the perfect one, I would find something like this with a nice top, really punchy. I would drag this in, copying my kick. I go back, I listen and I'm like, this is not the kick that I just chose. The kick that I just chose had a very strong top end and this one doesn't. So I don't know, maybe I dragged in the wrong sample. So I would redo this, drag this in once again. Same thing. What's wrong then? One day I noticed there was like a little fade at the beginning of each kick. You can definitely see this here, right? So for some reason, Ableton applies a little fade at the edges of the clips. And this can sometimes be useful, but not in this case. So to fix this every single time, I would go here and before copying all of my kicks, I would do something like this. Now I have my top back, but this is actually a setting that you should change immediately. So make sure to check if this is still enabled in your Ableton. You go here, live settings, and then you have all of these different panels. If you go to record, warp and launch, you click on it. Look at this, create fades on clip edges on. Why, why should this be on? Turn this off right now. You're not gonna need this. And if you need it, you're gonna do it manually. And for years, I kept asking myself, why do the samples sound different when I drag them in. You want the samples to sound exactly the same so you can try them out here and then drag them into the timeline and not have any of these issues ever again. You probably knew this already but there's always someone that finds out today for the very first time. Now let's move on to the next one, number two. And this is about quantization. This is very, very important. Do you quantize at all MIDI, audio? I'm pretty sure that you do, but when you do, which settings are you using? So let me show you mine and why you should probably change yours. First of all, to see the quantize settings, you gotta open either an audio clip or a MIDI clip. And it's a little bit different. So let's start with audio. I'm gonna double click this little shaker loop that I have. And once I'm here, I'm gonna right click in this uh, white space. If you go here, you're gonna read quantize or quantize settings. That's what you wanna click, quantize settings. So many people I've worked with like to keep this quantize setting to like one fourth or one eighth. So what happens if I just press quantize now, which is command U, as you can see, it's quantizing every eighth note because that's the way we set it. And uh, sometimes this can work. Like it depends what you're going for, of course. But the way I like to keep it is in grid. And the reason for this is because this is dependent on the grid that you see here. So this is a shaker loop and I probably wanna quantize this in 16th notes. And at the moment, the grid is already in 16th notes. I can confirm it by just right clicking here and just setting 1 16th. And now command U, this is the quantization that I want. But maybe for this specific loop, I only need to adjust the quantization every bar. I don't want it to sound like too robotic, for example. I just wanna make sure that at bar one, bar two, bar three, bar four, there's like some sort of quantization. And to do that, it takes one second. I just right click one bar, command U. And as you can see, we only added these little points right here. One bar is not even an option here in this little quantize menu. So this is one of the reasons why I use this and also for speeding up my process, because like I said, I don't wanna be opening this little menu every single time just to change from like 1 16th to 1 8th, 1 4th and so on. And these are my quantize settings for audio, but let's take a look at MIDI because that's a little bit different. So I have a MIDI clip right here with some chords. As you can see, the chords are not perfectly on the grid, but let's suppose we wanna quantize them. Same thing. I'm gonna right click here, quantize settings, which is gonna bring me to this little menu again. And as you can see, we have a couple more options compared to audio. So again, I'm gonna leave this in grid for the same reason that I already explained, but pay attention to how I set the way the notes are adjusted. I only enabled start and not end. By default, end is also enabled. So if you haven't changed this ever, most likely this is what's gonna look like the first time you open this menu. And the reason why I changed this and you should change it too, it's pretty intuitive actually. Most of the times when I wanna adjust the notes, I wanna adjust the start of the notes. And let's say I wanna quantize them. So 
this chord starts exactly at bar two. I can do it. I can just select this command U, but look at what happens at the end of the notes if I leave this enabled. I quantize and yes, the start is perfect, but look, now these three notes end exactly at the same time and they're not supposed to end exactly at the same time. That's not the way they were played. So it depends, of course, what's your goal. But in my case, this was not my goal at all. I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna disable this and now, when I quantize these notes, they're all gonna start at bar two exactly, but as you can see, the end is slightly different and this is the way that we're played. And you might be thinking, yeah, okay, but who cares? These notes, even if they finish at the same time, nothing changes and you might actually be right in this specific case, like there's not a big difference here, but there's a huge difference if you do this when programming MIDI drums. So for example, I have this right sample loaded into a simpler. Let me open it so you can actually see what's happening a little bit better. Okay, this is how it sounds. And I'm gonna play it on the upbeat. So as you can see, it's not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect because we're gonna quantize this. And if you've noticed, every note is a different length. Like we have this one, which is pretty short, this one that's kind of long, but they always sound the same. Like all the rides are exactly the same length. Why is that? Because the simpler is set in trigger mode. You can see it from here. Trigger mode is gonna play the whole sample no matter the length of the note. While gate, it's gonna gate the sample. It's gonna cut it the moment you release the note. So let me put this in gate and show you the difference. When the note is short, the ride is very short. When the note is long, it's gonna keep playing the ride sample until this very moment, and that's when it's gonna get cut. So why am I telling you this? Because if you keep this end enabled, every time you quantize something like that that's being used in gate mode, all the length of the samples are gonna get messed up completely. So let's say that I wanna quantize this in eighth notes, since these are eighth notes. Look at what happens. Like, what about the length that I was trying to get by playing the actual sample? Now, they all sound the same and it's completely different than it was supposed to be. Now, I wanna be able to keep this, like with different lengths of the samples, and I'm gonna do it by disabling this. And now look at this, all of these are exactly on the grid, but we preserved the length of the note, which is a key difference, especially when working with something like that or when working with a bass line, for example. This bass line that I just played, I definitely wanna quantize it, but I also wanna preserve the way I played it. I wanna preserve this long note and these short notes at the beginning. So that's why I'm gonna quantize them with this and disabled. And look at this. Perfect. Okay, great. So now let's move on to number three, latency settings. So I'm gonna show you my settings and how I change them depending on what I need to do and how you can improve the latency when recording. So the first thing to do, and everybody knows this by now, is going up here in options and enabling this reduced latency when monitoring. I bet you knew this already, but this is not it. Anyway, if you didn't know, now you know. And I always suggest that you go here on options, you check it, and then you save it as a default session. So every time you open a new session, that's already enabled you don't even have to worry about it. But what I really wanna talk about are these settings that you're gonna find again here in live settings and then audio. First of all, you gotta remember that depending on the audio interface that you have, you might see slightly different values. So don't worry if they're not exactly the same as mine. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is the buffer size. If you open this little menu, you have a bunch of options here. So what's best for recording? Generally speaking, just know that the lower you go, the lower the latency. For example, when you record some vocals or guitars, like it's essential that you sing exactly with that timing, okay? You don't wanna find yourself later having to adjust the vocals just because you had latency when recording. And also it's like very bothering to sing with some latency. So it's crucial that here you try to go as low as you can possibly go. And this most of the times depends on how powerful your computer is. So don't expect to be able to go down to like 32 samples, probably not even 64 unless you record Thing with like an empty session, like nothing else is happening in that session. Or if you have a very powerful computer, that's great. So let me show you now. The overall latency here is 49 with 27 in input. Okay, so let's go to 512. And as you can see, we went down like by a lot. We have now 28 milliseconds, which is quite a bit still. Like singing with this amount of latency, most singers will probably get back to you and be like, 
there's latency like i can't sing like that and trust me you don't want singers to tell you that you gotta know that before recording them let's go down to 128 now we have 12 milliseconds which is actually pretty good in this case my session is pretty empty my computer is very powerful so i can definitely go down to 32 samples and as you can see now it dropped to 8 milliseconds with only 6 milliseconds in input which is pretty amazing but most of the times you're not gonna need this 128 is probably gonna work just fine but there is something else that you should know not only the buffer size affects the latency also the sample rate if you've never changed this before most likely your sample rate is gonna be set to 44,000 which is absolutely fine nothing wrong about it I usually work at 48,000 but let me show you what happens if I drop this down to 44,000 so now the sample rate has dropped you can also see it from here in Ableton but look at the latency there's not a substantial difference like from 12 we went to 13 milliseconds so like it's probably unnoticeable but there is a little bit of a difference so i just want you to know that if you want to try to reduce the latency as much as possible going up with the sample rate is going to help at the same time though you got to know that as you go up with the sample rate the files are going to be bigger and bigger i don't really suggest that you go above 48,000. so either you use 44 or 48 that's going to work just fine number four this is a big one warp settings ableton's warping algorithms are the best in the game no other daw is that good at warping samples and it's not even close like many producers are switching to Ableton because of that but I don't think even half of the Ableton users actually know how to use warping effectively and how to use all of its features depending on your goal so let me show you my warp settings and how I change them depending on the result that I want to obtain first of all you're gonna find the warp settings again in live settings record warp and launch this is the section related to warp. so let's go through them together the first one is loop warp short samples and this is set to auto short samples what does that mean short samples could be like one shots could be maybe loops but very short loops and that's the reason why i keep this in auto you can decide to have always unwarped one shot which would be actually pretty smart for one shot why not warp one shot well let me show you why let's say that my tempo is 130 and i'm trying to bring in a sample that's been originally bounced at like 80 bpm there's a huge difference between 80 bpm and 130 so when i bring this in this kicks tom and i put it in a new track let's see what happened if i double click the sample i notice that the sample is warped because we chose that all the one shots have to be warped okay not only the bpm that ableton detected is wrong because this was bounced at 80 bpm but also look at what happens if i unwarp it like the length of the sample is different like the sample was supposed to be longer than that what ableton is doing is trying to make the sample fit in one bar because ableton is assuming that the sample was long one bar when it wasn't so by keeping this one shot warp I'm actually stretching it and I don't want to stretch a one shot like that. I don't want to stretch a kick sample. This has to sound the same no matter what BPM we're in. So that's the reason why I want to keep this in auto or unwarped one shot. Now the next one is one of the most important settings that you're going to find yourself toggling on and off all day, every single day. In some cases, you're going to need to keep this off. Let me give you an example. If you're importing stems, you already know the BPM of the stems. All the stems start exactly at the same position. So there is no need to warp those long samples. But let's say that instead you're about to import a song. You don't really know the BPM of that song and you're hoping that Ableton can detect it for you. So in this case, you want to go here settings warp i'm gonna set this to on because i need that long sample and hopefully ableton is gonna get it right so at this point i'm importing one kiss by calvin harris for example i'm not gonna play it for copyright reasons but i know for a fact that the bpm of this song is 124 so i can double click check and ableton actually got it right so if i left this in off the song wouldn't be warped, it would look something like that, but now my session is at 130 and I have no idea what's the actual BPM of that song. So as you can see, that's one of those settings that I cannot just tell you to keep on or off. It really depends on what's your ending goal. We've talked about fades on clip edges already. So the last thing that I wanna talk about is the default warp mode. I suggest you keep it in beats. But I wanna take a minute to talk about the different 
warp modes, we have a bunch of loops. And I chose these three samples to show you the different algorithms that you can use for warping audio depending on what you're working on and what your priorities are. If you're working with drums, generally you wanna keep this set to beats. Beats is the algorithm for drums and it works pretty well. And beats is generally the one that preserves the transients the best. So for example, I have this little loop. This is 100 BPM. I can just set the session to like 140 and listen to this. That's pretty good. The transients are almost perfectly preserved. I suggest that you always check. It also depends on how busy the loop is. If you have like a lot of percussions and other stuff, it might not work as good as it just did. But most of the times with kicks, claps, snares, stuff like that, it's gonna work amazing and really preserve those transients, which is super important when it comes to drum. Tones and texture, I don't really use these that much. The ones that I use the most, except for beats, are definitely complex, complex pro, and repitch. Let me take this little drum loop to show you the difference between these three. This drum loop is at 110, so I can definitely set this to beats because the BPM of the session is 100, it's pretty close to 110. It's gonna work very well. But if you set this to complex, it's still gonna sound pretty good, but listen. It's like the definition of the transients is slightly worse. It's like it's losing something. And the same goes for Complex Pro, and that's the reason why I almost never use complex algorithms for drums. Ah, stop, stop for a second. I'm editing the video now, and I just realized I forgot to say something important. There is actually one scenario where I'd like to use Complex or Complex Pro also with drums. If it's like very busy drums and we wanna change the tempo of these drums, Complex Pro might actually work better than beats. And same thing goes if you wanna change the tempo of like a full song. In a full song, you're gonna have drums, you're gonna have vocals, you're gonna have melodies, instruments. So when you change the tempo of all of that, if you try to use beats just because you're trying to preserve the transients, you might actually get a worse result than just using Complex or Complex Pro. Back to the video now, and let's talk about repitch. Repitch, you can guess it, repitches the sample because the sample, which is originally at 110 BPM, now is getting played at 100. And so it's like when you were playing, you know, the vinyls, and if you played the vinyl slower, the pitch was also going down. If you played the vinyl faster, the pitch was also going up. What you're gonna notice is that by using re-pitch and going at a lower BPM, like in this case, this sample is gonna be pitched lower. Listen to this. Compared to this, which was the original pitch. This is totally on you, it depends on what you wanna achieve, especially when the BPM is very different, like you take a loop that's 80 BPM and you put it in a track that's like 130. Repitch could be an interesting option because the quality is gonna be retained even though the pitch is gonna be changed massively. But this can be interesting to like create some effects. In this specific case, I kinda like that this loop is slightly pitched down. I love the sound of this. So guess what? If I just set this session to like 130, listen to this now. Not only it's faster, but it's getting pitched up by a lot. Last but not least, I wanna talk about vocals. Which algorithm is best for vocals? Is it beats? Is it complex? Is it complex pro? What's the difference? We have a vocal here, and the original BPM of this vocal is 85 BPM. Now, the session is 100, so this is 15 BPMs faster, which is quite a lot for vocals. If I just play it in beats, I've been thinking about your love tonight, yeah. Two hearts gonna make our worlds collide, baby. It doesn't sound bad, but you can definitely hear some, like, artifacts here and there because beats is not the best algorithm for vocals. The first thing you gotta ask yourself is what is your goal? In this case, my goal is bringing these vocals from 85 to 100 BPM and make sure that they sound good. So in this case, my priority is changing the tempo. And the best algorithm to do this by far is Complex Pro. So now if you listen to this, all of those artifacts are gonna be gone. I've been thinking about your love tonight. Yeah, two hearts gonna make our worlds collide, baby. That's perfect. That sounds really, really good. So what is the difference between Complex Pro and Complex? If I set this to Complex, you're gonna notice that the voice becomes a little bit more 
uh, metallic probably I think that's the best way to describe it if you listen carefully compared to complex pro you're gonna notice that some of these artifacts are still there and now the vocals sound a little bit more robotic I've been thinking about your love tonight yeah two hearts gonna make our worlds collide baby versus I've been thinking about your love tonight yeah two hearts gonna make our worlds collide baby it's very difficult to describe I hope that you're listening carefully with headphones to really understand the difference between these two modes but in this case what I'm trying to do again is change the tempo and for changing the tempo pro is definitely the best algorithm now what if I want to change the pitch of these vocals and not the tempo we bring the session back to 85 tempo stays the same but I don't know I want to bring it down three semitones let's listen to it I've been thinking about your love tonight yeah two hearts gonna make our worlds collide baby not bad not bad at all and we're using complex pro at the moment which leaves you also controls over format and envelope these two parameters now make a difference I've been and this is very about cool because tonight, just by changing yeah. these parameters listen make our worlds collide, baby. I've been thinking about your love tonight yeah. so the higher the formants the closer the vocals are going to sound to the original in terms of like tone in terms of timbre and as you go down I've been thinking about your love tonight you have that classic pitch down effect and if you use complex in this case I've been thinking about your love tonight it's pretty much the same thing as just keeping complex pro and putting these two at the very minimum. I've been thinking about your love Same thing. Tonight, yeah. So now we're left with one more scenario. What if you want to change the pitch and also the tempo of the song? Well, it depends. What's your priority? Is your priority making them sound natural? Is your priority making them sound pitched high, pitched low? Like it really depends what you want to do. So if I just set this session to 100, we're changing the tempo compared to 85 and we're also changing the pitch. I've been thinking about your love tonight. And this algorithm Really well. But maybe now I'm like, uh, you know, I just want this to sound a little bit closer to the original vocals. And so I can bring up this. I've been thinking about your love tonight. Yeah. Two hearts gonna make our worlds collide, baby. I've been thinking about your right? love tonight. Yeah. This is Two hearts pretty gonna awesome. Make I could spend an entire day just talking about warp settings, quantize settings, and show you how these things actually affect your productions. If you want to know more, definitely check out my masterclass, which is linked down in the description, because there I spent some more time talking a little more in depth about all of these little things. I hope that this is going to help you choosing the right algorithm depending on what you want to do from now on. And the last thing that I want to show you that is going to speed up your process by a lot is how to set default presets for plugins. What do I mean by that? Let's say that I want to load this EQ8. As you can see, as I open this down here on the left, I already have a high pass filter set up ready for me to use. And the same thing happens down here on the right. I have a low pass filter already set up. Why? Because this is the way I set it by default. Let's say that every time you open an EQ8, you want this little high pass filter at 75 Hertz. It's not something that I really suggest you do, but let's just take it as an example. You can right click on this EQ8 right here and see, save as default preset. I'm not going to click this because I don't want to do this. But if you click this, Every time you open the EQ8, that little high pass filter at 75 Hertz is gonna be set, ready to go. So this is not my default preset, but as you can see, when I open an EQ8, this is my default preset. So this way I can easily enable this and I have this ready at 30, I can just tweak it. Same thing, I have this one right here ready to be tweaked again. This is an amazing feature that's gonna save you so much time, not only with the EQ, you can do this with like utility, you can do this with like compressor, for example. Actually, let me do it. I rarely use this compressor for like actual compression. The way I use this compressor is always for sidechain compression. So why not set it as a default preset? So what I'm gonna do is open this, enable my sidechain, save as default preset. Write it, yes. So now, the next time I open a compressor, it's gonna be ready to go with the sidechain open. I can just select which track I need and ready to go. And the cool thing that not many people know about is that you can do the same thing also for audio and MIDI track. You can set the way a default audio or MIDI track look like. So let me show you. When I create a new audio track, it's already set in a way that we're taking the input from two, which is my microphone. And the reason I set it this way is because when I'm recording vocals for someone or for myself, it's very easy to just, you know, create a new track, arm it, and I know it's taken from the correct input, which is two in my case for the microphone. To do this, same thing. 
you do whatever you need to do like the changes that you want to do here whatever you need to do and then right click save as default audio track you can do the same thing for the media track so this is amazing this is going to speed up your process by a lot so guys we got to the end i really hope that you enjoyed this video i hope that ableton now is a little bit less intimidating and starting today you can start to apply all of these little things and really level up your productions if you have any questions as always leave a comment below like the video subscribe to the channel in case you haven't already guys it's free and there's a ton of knowledge that i'm sharing for free so make sure that you subscribe to the channel thank you so much for watching i'll see you in the next one